Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. But I have missed you. I have missed you. I have missed being with you. And today we are starting a brand new series. I'm pretty excited about it. It's a little bit deeper of a series. It's, it's a theological idea. This series is called Already and Not Yet. Already and Not Yet. We're going to dive into this over the next four weeks, three or four weeks, discovering what this means. Uh, it's, it's a concept of Jesus Christ already has completed his finished work, but we have not yet ascended into glory. And so what are we supposed to do in the in-between? What is our obligation? What is our response to the finished work of Jesus in our everyday lives? The key text for this series is found in Ephesians 1, 7. It says this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now before we go on, let's take a look at this word redemption. In Jesus, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. And redemption refers to the work of Christ on our behalf, whereby he purchases and ransoms us at the price of his own life. So he gave his life so that we could have life. You got that? Has anybody ever redeemed a five-cent can back at the little machine that crunches it? You get your five cents back. You know, you paid five cents when you bought that soda, but you redeemed it back when you put it in the machine. It's a buyback. Jesus bought us back, but the price of buying us back from sin, buying us back, let's say, from Satan, was giving his own life. Securing our deliverance from the bondage and condemnation of sin. We're going to unpack that today. Father, we thank you as we get into your word today. We pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come today. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we there yet? Has your kids ever said that, traveling on a trip from the back seat? Or maybe you remember saying it as a kid. Are we there yet? I asked that question once. One time as a kid, we were driving from New York down to Florida. We were going to go to Disney, the happiest place on earth. We're driving, and I said, are we there yet? And my dad was not happy about that question. He said, boy. Now, my dad says, boy, it's a problem. He forego every formality of name, and it's just boy. Boy, when the car stops and we get out. We're there. That was his answer. And I could just see in his eyes that he was not very happy about the situation. We were only about an hour and a half into the 24-hour drive. (laughs) But as you know, if you're driving from New York to Florida, you're not getting there on one tank of gas. It's about seven tanks, right? So we pull into the first gas station. The car stopped. We got out. (laughs) Dad, are we there? Shut up. Never ask the question again. Never ask again. Are we there yet? In the movie The Incredibles, the kids ask Mr. Incredible the same question. Are we there yet? And Mr. Incredible it responds in a little bit nicer way than my dad responded to me. He says, we'll get there when we get there. We'll get there when we get there. And in light of biblical truths and this concept of the kingdom of God and already and not yet we see that the biblical reign of God has been brought to the world through Jesus Christ, but we are still the kids in the back seat wondering why the world doesn't look like we're there yet, right? Jesus Christ comes to earth. He brings his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus Christ comes. Uh, John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is here. The kingdom is here. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like a Christian. I don't feel saved. I'm still struggling with some stuff. And if the kingdom of God is here, and I have salvation, and I have been redeemed, then why do I struggle with a bunch of stuff? 
Can I be transparent for a minute? I mean, I struggle with overeating. And all y'all sitting there in judgment. Thanksgiving's coming. We'll see what's up. We'll see what's up. We'll see if you overeat too. Right? Come on now. We all have something that we deal with. It might be, you know, a negative attitude. It might be gossip. You know, talking about someone behind their back. Gossip simply is talking about someone behind their back, offering no solution to fix the problem. That's gossip. A lot of us do it. Church people love to gossip. They call it a prayer chain, but it ends up being a gossip chain. Did you hear what happened? Okay, are we praying for them or are we just talking about this? Anyway, you get what I'm saying. If I'm redeemed and I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, then how come sometimes it's hard to be good? It's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to live by Christian ethics. If I'm saved, why do I struggle? If we are in the kingdom of God now on earth, then why sometimes does life seem so hard? What are we supposed to do right now? How are we supposed to respond to God in life today? Let's go to the scripture. Let's break this down. Let's look at some passages and then set up this series. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, uh, 3 through 10 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has, say has, past tense, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is a finished work. This has already happened. So, man, but this is kind of hard, right? He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing. How come I don't feel like it then? How come I feel like I don't have every blessing? How come there's days I don't feel blessed? It's, and sometimes it's like we got these sunglasses on, these lenses that are kind of blocking us from seeing the truth of the blessed life that we actually have. Sometimes there's things that are just blocking us from walking in the blessings of God. It's not because we don't already have them, we just don't actually access them. We beg God for blessings we already have, or at least have access to, and many times we don't walk and live in it. So he says, we have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. For he chose in him, in Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. He chose before the foundation of that we are to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. Watch this, verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Man, that's a whole nother theological debate that we could be in, in the topic of predestination. Predestination. What does predestination mean? Does God pick and choose who is going to heaven and who's not going to heaven before the world was created? Now let me just explain this on our theological point of view, and maybe you disagree and we can debate that some other day. But before the creation of the earth, God predetermined, predestined that all men should come to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ. He created a plan whereby all people could be saved. Now, will all people choose Christianity? No. No. And God knows that. Now, what we have to understand this is foreknowledge doesn't mean that God is micromanaging and making those things happen. He knows all things, but he's not controlling all those things. God is not making you be a Christian or not making you be a Christian. And, and the concept of predestination can kind of get really wonky and dirty, right? Because you can raise your kids in the way of the Lord. They love Jesus Christ. But predestination would say, even if you accept Jesus, even if you live a perfect life, if God didn't choose you, you're not going to heaven. Well, that stinks. That stinks. Because my Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you talk to someone who believes in predestination, and they say, well, you know, all doesn't mean all. Well, let's just stop being stupid. If it says all, it means all. It means all people. And the concept behind that was, at that time, the truth or the Torah was written to the Jews. And they're coming out and saying, no, Gentiles, Samaritans, all can believe this gospel and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
So what did God predestine or what did he predetermine? He predetermined the plan of salvation. He predestined Jesus would come to the earth, he would save all mankind or at least offer salvation to all mankind and we could accept that and choose it. He predetermined that all should come to sonship in Jesus Christ. To the praise and the glorious grace which he freely given us in the one he loves. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now I'm going to tell you about this. The riches of God's grace ain't ever going to declare bankruptcy. The riches of his grace ain't ever going to run out of funds like Social Security. That's a joke. The riches of his grace is eternal. And that is your salvation as well. He's equating your salvation to the riches of his grace. That he lavished on us, lavished lots and lots of grace. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. And that's kind of tricky too, like, what do you mean he showed us the mysteries? I still don't understand the Bible. You're talking about the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel was Jesus Christ. He made it evident. It wasn't some idea. He actually sent a person, a human being, so that the world was left without excuse. He made it obvious and evident from his good pleasure. Verse 10, to be put in effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring the unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. So here's the struggle. This scripture says in past tense that we have redemption. Redemption is ours. We've been bought back. The price has been paid. We have been redeemed. But we have not yet experienced the day of redemption. And it's so confusing because it's the same word. I wish there was two separate words. I wish we could separate this and understand it a little bit different. We've been redeemed. But there is a day that's called the day of redemption that we have not experienced yet. We have not yet been, let's say, raptured. We have not yet been glorified. We have not yet ascended to heaven to be with Jesus. So we're in this in-between moment. We have Christ. We have salvation. We are redeemed. But we haven't yet experienced the day of redemption. Let's look at that in Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This hasn't happened yet. We're sealed, but we haven't seen the day of redemption yet. So we have these bookends of redemption. We've been redeemed. There's redemption of sin. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed you until, future tense, until the day of redemption. So we're in this in between. And this can be kind of confusing. So I'm going to take this confusing theological concept of already and not yet, and I'm going to try to make it somewhat plain and simple. And through this series, what I want to look at is maybe not so much proving already and proving not yet. I want to look at what is our response supposed to be in the in between, in the middle of it, our lifetime. What is our lifetime supposed to mean? What are we supposed to accomplish in our lives? I think the dash between your birth date and your death date should mean something. It shouldn't just be a blank horizontal line. It should be a story. It should have a whole story connected to it. There should be a bunch of things that you've accomplished in that life. Here's what I know. Christianity was never designed to be a spectator sport. We were never supposed to just sit back and watch God work. We were invited into a community of believers to act out or live out the Christian life. There are some things that we are responsible for in this life. So here's the deep dive. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament has this word kingdom. Say kingdom. 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 And a lot of times when we think of the word kingdom, we think of a castle. A building, right? Like we're going to get our hiking boots on, we're going to climb a mountain, we're going to see this big castle, and there's the kingdom. And that's not really what the term kingdom in the Bible means. So both Old Testament and New Testament, both Hebrew and Greek, 
have this word kingdom. In the Old Testament, it is the word malkut, which is M-A-L-K-U-T, malkut. And in the New Testament, it's basileia, basileia, both meaning kingdom. And it is understood as a dynamic term in its nature. And it means not a building or a castle, but it means the rule of a king. The kingdom is the rule of a king. The king's rule. So it didn't matter where the king was, wherever the king was, was his kingdom. Because it was his rule. As long as he was alive, he ruled as the king. And it is ever seldom in the Bible in reference to a static sense or a territory. So as a result, in the vast majority of instances in the Bible, it would be better translated, instead of saying the kingdom of God, it would be better translated to say the rule of God. So when John the Baptist says, repent, the rule of God is at hand. The rule of God is at hand. God is here. His ruling power, his ruling reign has come to earth. And this could, Jesus understood it this way. And it's evident from such passages like Luke 19, 12, when Jesus said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king. Literally, it says this, this man traveled a distance to receive a kingdom, to receive the rulership. Maybe you understand this one. Matthew 6, seek ye first the rule of God. Seek ye first the rule of God, right? Because if we say, seek ye first the kingdom of God, what, what are we talking about here? Seek ye first, what, the castle? Seek ye first the church? The church building? No. Seek ye first the rule of God in your life. Let God rule and reign. Let God help you make decisions in your life. Let him be the leader in your life, right? So understood as the reign of God... It is possible for Jesus to announce the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises when he says, I'm here. This is it. The rule of God is here. Indeed, the kingdom of God is already now. It's already here. All right? So now we're going to come back out of the deep end. I had to set this up for the series. The kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, is all, has already come. We already have access to God through salvation. We celebrate this. We participate in this. We do uh, salvation calls. We do water baptisms. All of this is surrounded around the already. What we struggle with is what do we do about Christian ethics and biblical living until he returns? What do we do about Christian ethics and biblical living until he returns. Because that can be so difficult sometimes, right? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that is, which is uplifting to those who hear it. But sometimes some of us in here, not saying everybody, but some of us struggle with saying dirty wordies. And then we even have like a scale of what dirty wordies are acceptable and which ones are not acceptable. Right? Like there are some four-letter words we can say that's, ah, whatever, it's just whatever. And then some of them you say, it's like, whoa, where did that come from, right? I mean, that's part of Christian ethics and biblical living. Like, what is your belief and your view on saying bad words? Is that uplifting to people who hear? Like, what do we do in this in-between? So we have a verse like, Ephesians 1, 7 that says we have redemption. And then we have another verse in same book of the Bible, Ephesians 4, 30 says, but you don't have redemption yet. We have redemption, but you have not yet had the day of redemption. <coughs> Let's go even further. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Check this one out. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ... Past tense, right? They've already been sanctified in Christ. To those who have been sanctified in Jesus Christ and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. 
right? So how do you become sanctified or set apart? By calling on the name of the Lord. It's right there. But then it becomes very confusing because we're not completely sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Well, doggone. Am I sanctified or not? Am I sanctified or not? Yes, I'm already sanctified, but I'm not yet fully sanctified. This is just so confusing, man. Right? Let's, let's just be for real. Anybody here struggle with anything that's unbiblical? Anybody ever get angry? Anybody beat their dog for going potty in the house? But it scratched at the door for an hour and you didn't let it out? Right? Come on, somebody. Ever fight with your spouse? Ever get upset at your kids? Ever get upset with someone who cuts you off on the highway? Come on. Right? There's these things that we deal with in life. It's called the struggle of the flesh. Although I am sanctified spiritually, I still deal with things in my flesh. Let's break that down. I had an addiction for a long time. It was a bad addiction. Now, it wasn't a bad addiction. Like, it wasn't like a bad, like, it wasn't drugs, but it was bad, like, I did this a lot. I was addicted to McDonald's french fries. <laughs> McDonald's french fries. The crunchy goodness with the fine salt sprinkled over it. Fresh, hot, burn your hand hot. But you got to get a chocolate milk, I mean a, a chocolate shake, so you could dip the french fries in the, in the chocolate shake, and then you got the sweet and the salty. But here's the truth. If I never had my first round of McDonald's french fries, I would not have had a problem with them. So I blame my parents. My parents bought me a, a Happy Meal. My parents did it to me. Put me on the road of addiction. But my spirit wasn't craving McDonald's french fries. I wasn't in worship and the Holy Spirit says, ooh, you need some french fries. <laughs> Your worship will be set off if you get some french fries. No, that didn't happen. It wasn't my spirit. It was my body. My body like, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Need some potato goodness, need some carbohydrates. And you find yourself trying to do something spiritual, trying to worship God, and all you see, golden arches. <laughs> quick on 211. Right here, quick exit right there. Bam, hit the drive through. Get the biggie fry. Come on, somebody. 3,000 calories in one little box. My flesh desired something that it had tasted and deemed it to be good. And that's what sin is in our lives. That's what sin is in our lives. Intellectually and spiritually, we can understand that there are some behaviors that we enjoy doing that do not align with Scripture. And when that happens, it's called sin. It's called sin. There are desires of the flesh. That we have done, and, and, and the reason why we have an addiction to it or affinity for it or keep coming back to it is because our body defines it as being pleasurable, as being good. So although my spirit is perfected unto God, my spirit has been redeemed, my spirit has been sanctified, my body still busted. Still busted. <laughs> still got issues, right? Still got some problems, still got some anger that I deal with, still got some resentment, still got some neurotic emotion, right? Like for me personally, I lean to negative emotion before I lean to positive emotion. I can always see the glass half empty. Tell me it's half full. I'm like, but I drank half of it. Still not full, right? Like in my own life, I deal with these things just like many of you. Because although we have already arrived to salvation, we have not arrived to glorification. 
I'm just taking a lot of time to set the base for the series, okay? It's going to be a little bit more fun, a little bit more light the further we get in it. Believers are encouraged both by the victories of the already and the defeats of the not yet. There's that struggle. There's this defeat of the not yet. Like maybe some of you are dealing with something in your body, like sick, sickness or disease. And we understand that healing has been provided for us, but I have not yet seen the manifestation of it. And it feels sometimes like we're in a waiting area, a waiting zone. God, your word promised that it's done, but I have not yet seen it manifest in my life. And this is hard. So is it real or not? Do I have healing or not? And we're in this moment of in-between. Similarly, because you, we have experienced defeat, we have experienced sorrow, we have seen the corruption of the world around us, hopefully instead of us turning away from God, we more eagerly await the not yet. I think that's where Christianity has missed it in the last 20 years. We have forgotten the blessed hope. We have forgotten what heaven is going to be like. And we stop looking at that because we've been so busy building our own kingdoms, building our own lifestyles, that we forgot what the mission of God was. I want to read this quote to you by George Ladd. It's up on the screen if you want to take a picture. It's kind of deep and complex. Maybe go back and read it if you take a picture. Before the eschatological appearing of God, and that just, it's a fancy word for the end times. Before the end time appearing of God's kingdom at the end of the age, God's kingdom has become dynamically active among men in Jesus' person and mission. So Jesus came to this earth to bring his kingdom rule to activate the army of God. To activate us to be part of Missio Dei, the mission of God. This is literally what he did. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, came to earth to activate us to service. So what this is saying. The kingdom in this age is not merely the abstract concept of God's universal rule to which men must submit. No one has to become a Christian. We have free will. Watch. It is rather a dynamic power at work among men. It's at work among us. It's for us and through us. Before the apocalyptic coming of God's kingdom and the final manifestation of his rule to bring in the new age, God has manifested his rule. He has manifested his kingdom to bring men in advance of the eschatological error, the blessings of his redemptive reign. There is no philosophical or historical or exegetical reason why God's kingdom, God's rule, cannot manifest itself in two different ways at two different times to accomplish the same ultimate redemptive end. Now, I know that's deep, and you may not comprehend it right off the bat. He's just basically saying this, man. We cannot put God's kingdom in a box. Because God himself operates outside of time and space. So we must understand that there are two workings of redemption, the already and the not yet. And he can work both at the same time. But for us, we can't. Us, we can't. We, 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 we don't fathom that. Because all we really know is right now. And for some of us, right now is really good. And some of us right now is really sucky. For some of us, it's hell on earth. Some of us, it's heaven now. Right? For some of us, it can't get any worse. And for some of us, man, it couldn't get any better. So I don't know what now you're in. I don't know what now season or now moment you're in. But there is a purpose and a mission for which you were created and why you are here right now now. It's the mission of God. It's the mission of God. You are not here just for you. You are here for the person next to you. 
You are here for the neighbor that lives next to you. You are here to go into all the world and share the gospel and to be a light to the world, to be salt and light on the earth today. And so many times we're just sitting back, we're like, I'm just going to wait for the end times. I'm in heaven, I believe Jesus is Lord, but I ain't doing nothing. I'll tell you, you find more fulfillment in your life if you do something for God. Maybe you're here today, uh, let, me, let me back this up. No one that is here today is here by accident. It is not by accident that you got invited to church today. It is not by accident you decided to roll out of bed and drag your whole family. It is not by accident that your wife bribed you and blackmailed you into coming to church today. It is not by accident that you are here today. But the predestination of God who before the, uh, before the creation of the earth saw you. Saw this moment. It's a kairos moment. It's a window of time. He saw this time and says, that void, that emptiness, that lack of hope, that lack of drive, that need for purpose, it's me. What you're missing is me. You're missing the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. You're missing the freedom that comes with knowing Christ. You're missing the Holy Spirit that will give you power to be a witness. See, I love, I love that about Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 says this, like, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what transforms you into a witness. Not that you go witnessing, but your life becomes a witness. Listen, what makes, what makes Christmas time so magical is going around looking at the lights. They're beautiful, they're attractive, they draw us in, they're inspiring. And God says, you are the light of the world. You're the light that darkness is looking for. You're the light that is attracting. And then Jesus says, but if you lift me up, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. So let people see the light, but point them to the cross. It's really not that hard, you don't have to know theology. You don't have to know the definition of eschatology, exegetical, and none of that. You just need to be a reflection of the glory of God. A reflection of the glory of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing in the in-between. The in-between. Inviting people to church, being a good neighbor, helping the poor, sowing into the kingdom. There's an agenda. There's a mission. But I want to talk to the person today that is here, who's been struggling in this moment of life. Maybe you've gone through a breakup. Maybe you're not doing great in college. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe everything in life is great, but yet you're just not happy. Like, why, why am I not happy? I've got everything I need. On paper, I look like I got a great life, but I'm just not happy. I'm not fulfilled. There's a void, there's something missing. M might, I, might I ask, like, maybe you've never fully surrendered to the rule of God in your life. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you have a mental assent, you have an agreement to the ideology of Christianity. Like, yeah, that's good. Jesus was a good person, I agree with that. But agreeing that the Bible is true is not the same as accepting Christ as your Lord. Two completely different things. Because when I accept Christ as my Lord, it means I submit to his rulership. I submit to his leading. I submit to his direction. Now, does that mean that, okay, I submit to God's ruling, his direction, and now I'm perfect? No. No. Spiritually you are. Physically you're going to mess up the next day. But then the Holy Spirit comes in. And I, and I just want to give you this teaching. The Bible talks about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And man, I've just heard it molested and messed up so many times. I've got to tell you that God is a good God. Amen? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will convict sinners of sin. Right? And then the Bible does say that the Holy Spirit will convict Christians. But it's not of sin. 
The Holy Spirit's not convicting you when you mess up. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts Christians of their righteousness. That's two completely different things, right? So when you mess up and you hear that thing that says, you're so stupid. Why are you so dumb? Why do you do that same thing over and over again? What's wrong with you? That's not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So hopefully you ain't listening to the devil. Hopefully you ain't listening to the devil. You might be listening to your own psyche. You might be listening to your own insecurity of what you think about yourself. You may be telling yourself that you're stupid, so dumb, but never the Holy Spirit would never say that. You know what the Holy Spirit would tell you? You have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are ten times better. You're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field. Everything you set your hands to will prosper and be successful. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He reminds you, he will remind you of who you are. Come on, somebody. And some of us need that reminding. Some of us need the reminding of how great you actually are. How beautiful you are how anointed you are, how blessed you are. Some of you got some beautiful families raising great kids. And I know that you may have struggles and sticky points and you know, when they're 13, they become straight idiots. I get that. Maybe someone's struggling financially. Someone's struggling in their marriage. Someone's struggling at work. And I get that. I understand that. But today I would ask, that if you've never invited the Holy Spirit to be part of your life, if you've never invited the kingdom rule of God into your life, today's a kairos moment. Today's a window of opportunity. Today's the day of salvation, as the Bible says. Make today a turning point in your life where you say, I remember on this date, I gave my life to Christ and I began to serve him and follow him. If you're watching online or you're in the room, and you've never had the opportunity, or maybe you've skipped over the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would love to do that with you today. And here's the prerequisite. The Bible says this, all, say all, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there is a formula. The Bible says it is with the heart that we believe, but it is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. We believe in our hearts, we confess with our mouth. And how do we do that? With a prayer of salvation. And if you need to pray this prayer today, please pray this with me. We love you so much, we'd like to pray it out loud. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.